Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Yeah, yeah great. Um, okay, um, what I'm going to talk about is medical error. Um, it's the fifth or sixth, depending on who you believe, uh, fifth or sixth leading cause of death uh, in the US and probably worldwide. It kills between 100,000 and 200,000 people a year. The equivalent, if you like, of around about 30 jumbo jet crashes per month in the USA, six in the UK, and two in Australia. And that's just in those three countries. In fact, it's not all about injuries, it's not all about deaths. In about 50% of healthcare delivery, we don't deliver what we want to deliver. Um, we get it wrong. Um, about one in 10 hospitalized patients have some sort of error associated with their care. And if we take an audience, this isn't quite 300 people, uh, if, we, if we took an audience of about 300 people, 20 or 30 of you would be um, injured, five or six seriously, and one of you would probably die through medical error. The equivalent in aviation is that you would be on a plane for 36,000 years before you need to be injured, before you're going to be injured seriously. I'm interested in why that difference, uh, why that difference exists. Because this isn't about bad people. Many doctors and many people think that Bad, it's only bad doctors who make mistakes, but we're all human. Every single one of us is human, and every single one of us makes mistakes. The difference is, when I go to work, and when I'm up here, if I fluff my lines, it doesn't really matter. Uh, nothing happens. Uh, but with doctors and nurses, when they make a mistake, it can kill. The, the other issue here is, the other, the other reason why this is, uh, this is so interesting, why we need to ask why, is that doctors don't come to work to kill people. They spend an enormous <laughs> amount of time, they spend an enormous amount of time studying and learning and have to make incredible personal and financial sacrifices to get to the point where they can treat people and look after them. They don't deliberately come to kill people, but they do. Um, <laughs> why? Why does this happen? Well, one reason is that it's only in the last 10 or 15 years we've realised how serious this problem is. Oh, and the, sorry, the reason, and one of the reasons why is that instead of these being big airplane crashes that, that, go, you know, that, that everyone hears about, the same people, sorry, the, the different people are dying for the same reasons right across the world. Take, for example, one drug called Vincristine. Vincristine is a drug that you, is a chemotherapy drug. If you inject it intravenously, it will treat your cancer. If you inject it into the spine intrathecally, it's got an almost 100% mortality associated with it. We've known about this for about 30 or 40 years, and it kills about one person every year. The issue here is actually that you can connect an intrathecal to an intravenous line, which enables us to do it. When we go to our petrol, uh, when we go to our gas station, sorry, English coming out of me, <laughs> when we go to our gas station, the nozzles are designed so that we can't fill our, our, our gas car with diesel and vice versa. Why is it that in healthcare we haven't got those connectors? That would save all these lives. Another, uh, another, in, a, in another famous incident, um, a doctor took out, instead of took it, taking out a diseased kidney, he took out a healthy kidney. The, there was a medical student in that operation who said, uh, Mr. Such and Such, the surgeon, I think you're taking out the wrong, uh, uh, the wrong kidney. He, in his belief in himself, which he has to be as a surgeon, didn't believe what the, what, uh, what the medical student was saying, took out the, diseased, uh, took out the healthy kidney and the patient died. Sometimes, lots of deaths happen in a short space of time. Um, both in Manitoba in Canada and in Bristol in the UK in the mid-90s, we recognised that lots of very sick babies who are having heart operations, who actually should have been cured by these heart operations, were dying. And it was only after a, quite a long period of time that we realised quite a few of these had died. In the UK, about 100 babies died who, who shouldn't have done. Um, and we realised that actually it's because the systems of care, the hospitals, couldn't support the care that was needed for these incredibly complex and very, and very sick babies. So something needs to be done. We need to understand why these things are happening. Um, why me? I've got no medical training at all. 
I've never spent an hour in any sort of official medical training. I look at the relationship between people and systems. If you like, I'm, a, I, I do this, I, I'm, I'm interested in the science of psychology. I look at why people do what they do in complex systems and in their environment because I know that behaviour is less actually about free will and much more about the situation in which we find ourselves. What, I, and what that enables me to do is understand why people make mistakes and the situations in which they make mistakes and how we might build any sort of system to make people do better and rather than worse. In my last job, I worked with x-ray screeners at, uh, at, uh, at UK airports and helping them to detect knives, guns and bombs. And we, were we were able to improve that uh, uh, spectacularly. Um, so what we're talking about is trying to think about how we can make doctors, uh, help doctors and nurses um, to do the right thing, to make it easy to do the right thing and difficult to do the wrong thing. If we understand about the people, we can design for them. If we, if we forget about them and just get obsessed with technology or processes or, or ways of doing things, we're not going to um, uh, succeed. If you like, it's how iPhones and, uh, and cars are designed so that you can pick them up and use them. You don't need any training. They're designed with the, with the user in mind. And this is a discipline known as human factors or ergonomics. And that's what I do. Um, most of these industries, aviation, design, you know, lots of design, um, have had people like me working for them for decades. Uh, in the case of aviation industry, about 50 years. But this is a really new thing in healthcare. So I began to look at, uh, about nine years ago, I began to look uh, at what we might do about this by standing in uh, probably the most complex and high risk sort of surgery that you can, uh, you can be involved with. Um, these are very sick babies who have got hearts that, that, that basically don't function. 20 or 30 years ago, they would have died at the age of six months and there was nothing we could do. Nowadays, because we have technologies and teams and know-how, we can cure these little babies. Um, and it takes a team of about eight people, three, four, five hours um, to, 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 to do one of these operations. Um, a lot of people wondered what I was doing there without any medical training in this incredibly complex and, uh, and high-risk sort of surgery. And sometimes I wondered why too. But, <laughs> but actually, because it, um, but actually, one of these operations was quite an epiph epiphany for me. As usual, what I'd done is I'd talked to the parents of this little baby who was going to have this operation, and I said, look, what we want to do is learn how to get better at what we do. Um, uh, and and they'd given me, uh, they've given, uh, given me permission to go into, their opera into the operation of that little girl to, see what, to, 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 to really observe what was going on. The difference was, in this particular operation, about 45 minutes into it, um, I realised that this baby was bleeding to death in front of my eyes. Um, and this is because the, tr the trainee surgeon, in, opening this, in, in, uh, in, in accessing this little girl's heart, had nicked, probably the most, had nicked a hole in probably the most important uh, vessel in the body, which is called the, the aorta. It's the one that sends, sends uh, oxygenated blood from the, uh, uh, from the heart around the body. Um, it wouldn't have been as serious, except at that point there was no senior doctor in the room. There was no senior anesthesiologist and there was no senior um, surgeon. They came quite quickly and because this, this, this excellent trainee was good at what he did, by the way, the, this, the, this, uh, the, the, the little nick that he made um, I don't think is, uh, was, was particularly avoidable. Um, what, was, what happened next was the, uh, the, the trainee surgeon knew exactly what should happen. Um, and so uh, he, uh, he, he asked for support from the senior doctors who came very quickly. And the senior surgeon who wanted to, to be in control and didn't see how serious the situation was said, no, no, that's the wrong thing. I'm going to scrub up and I'm going I'm to sort it out myself. Well, the trainee surgeon actually realised how sick this baby was and he made the decision that saved this baby's life, which was to overrule the senior doctor. Now, in the hierarchy of surgery, that's an incredibly brave thing to do. Surgery is, and, and medicine in general is incredibly hierarchical. Um, 
the, uh, the, the Welsh, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the wrong kidney story that I talked about earlier um, was exactly the opposite of this case. But in this, in, in this case, the trainee surgeon was able to make, uh, make the right decision. And by doing so, saved that baby's life. Seeing how close this baby had come to death and thinking about the fact that afterwards, nobody got together and said, how do we avoid this in the future? How do we do be get better? Everyone disappears off in a hospital into their own little parts, parts of the hospital. The nurses go to the, to, to the nursing areas and the, the surgeons go off to their areas and the anesthesiologists to go, go off to their areas. No one learns from these things. And I thought, well, that's crazy because we could learn so much. And that's where I became much more passionate about what I do, how I realized what I can do to help. Why I can help is because my discipline, human factors, applied psychology, um, is, has spent years analyzing accidents to understand why they happen. Chernobyl, Challenger, uh, Three Mile Island, Exxon Valdez, Tenerife, a whole host of other aviation accidents. We know in great detail why these happen, and we know it's not just about bad people. We know that actually there's always a sequence of events that, uh, that, that, that come to pass that, that create the situation where the last error is made. If you like, our systems are like Swiss cheese, full of holes. There's no, no perfection, and occasionally all those holes line up, and we have an injury. It's easy to blame the last person making the last mistake. But if we do that, and we sack them, and we sue them for negligence, and we strike them off, we don't learn anything. And it just means that it's going to happen again. This is a picture I got from the BBC website when I was researching this, uh, this talk uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in France, this particular person had managed to park <laughs> their car in a subway. <laughs> How on earth could somebody do something so stupid? Well, some of the evidence is here if you read the article. There's a sign saying parking right in front. <laughs> Not only that, a similar incident took place about five years ago. <laughs> somebody else has done this too. Exactly the same with medicine. So it's about knowing when errors are most likely, knowing when they're going to happen, understanding that there are near misses, that when things happen that we need to think about why they happen and, and deal with them. If you don't believe me, I'm going to, uh, even though I'm running short on time, uh, I'm going to do a little demonstration of how I'm going to make you make an error. Right, so what I want you to do is stand up. <laughs> All right. So, those are, this will work for those of you who are right-handed. For those of you who are left-handed, just do a mirror, mirror image of what I'm going to say. So you stand on your left leg, and you swing your right leg clockwise, and you try and draw a six in the air. Thank you very much. Sit down. Sit down. Thank you. Um, so that's a demonstration of how the brain has blind spots in it that we don't realize. And if we were to design a system that relied on somebody doing that, it would fail miserably and very, and very quickly. Our, our, you know, our world is full of these things that can trip us up. And my job is to understand where those are, to combine aspects of psychology with design, uh, um, uh, an understanding of human beings to, uh, to, to try and stop those events happening. So why do America, medical errors happen? Well, as I, start, as I was doing my research, standing in operating rooms, looking at, these little, looking at, looking at how teams behaved, and looking, actually at, it, it, looking at little things that, that were going wrong all the time, and sometimes they would gather together to create more serious problems. Mostly didn't they didn't make a difference, but sometimes they did. For, you know, it might be that a miscommunication on top of a broken piece of equipment, on top of you know, somebody who wasn't there, on top of uh, a distraction from, a, from a, a phone or a pager in the, in the operating room would create the situation where patients might get injured. Not only that, but there was little learning. And people, didn't really, people weren't really learning anything from the errors they were making or anything from one operation to the next. So the same things were going wrong all the time. 
Um, there are time and financial pressures that, that, uh, that, uh, that these people are under, that doctors and nurses are under. Um, there's lots of variation. Nobody really knows what right looks like because one surgeon will do something completely different to what another surgeon does. So it's very difficult to understand when things are going wrong. But why do they continue to happen? Well, I started to then talk to lots of doctors about what I'd seen. Oh, sorry, I've, I've skipped out. <laughs> These are the sorts of things. <laughs> this is a crash trolley. This, this is a checklist that's, that's meant to be uh, for making sure that the right supplies are on a crash trolley when, uh, for, when, when, for dealing with people who have cardiac arrest. Um, I took that uh, photo um, and about 18 months later uh, there, was a, there was a message that came around from the medical director of this hospital um, saying, uh, oh, we've had lots of incidents with things not being available on crash trolleys. Um, this is, uh, this is two, two, two different infusion pumps. Infusion pumps are very important. You know, you've got to get the settings right to make sure you deliver the drugs correctly. This one, the seven, eight, nine are along the top. Here, one, two, three are along the top. So, of course, we're making people make mistakes. This is an anesthetic machine where the main function button is right next to the on-off button. <laughs> it's not that, this isn't, sometimes this isn't rocket science. <laughs> so I talked to lots of doctors about this. And actually, I had a, a doctor heckle me about that and say I'd never make that mistake. Um, some liked what I was saying. Lots of people liked what I was saying. Lots of people have been very supportive. Some have hated it. Some have been really extremely nasty, nasty to me about what I'm saying. But actually, that's a real shame, because what I genuinely want to do is improve the, the working lives of the doctors and nurses, because actually, if we do that, then we'll re reduce the number of errors. There's so many things like this in our healthcare systems worldwide. You know, it, it's, it, a lot of it is, is really not that difficult. Um, it's challenging for a surgeon to have somebody without any medical training to come in and say, well, actually, the world that you thought was like this is something completely different. Um, it's, it's, you don't have control over everything. And so that's one of the resistances we get. They're trained for 20 years to say that they're, they're in control, but actually they're not. What they do is incredibly dependent on lots of different things. Um, so what we started to do is get them to do a briefing before they go, went into operations, so that all the team would be working from the same, uh, same hymn sheet, from doing the same thing. It was incredible to me that they'd go into these five-hour incredibly complex operations and never talk up together about that, what they were going to do first. And this, in aviation, by the way, happens in every flight. You'll get the crew together and they'll say, right, we're flying here and these are the things we expect. These are the things, you know, we've got uh, bad weather here, so we're going to need to navigate around. You know, all those sorts of things. But trying to encourage doctors to do this is, is very much, is very difficult. We're still trying to do that, just to get them to talk about what they're going to do before they do it. Um, this particular project was about learning why Ferrari were able to change four, four tires on a car and fill it with fuel during the motor racing incredibly reliably, and yet at the, same, at the center is human beings. So they get their human beings to, to do this incredibly reliably. So we went to Ferrari and actually learned all sorts of things about how to organize our tasks and how to, how to organize our systems of work, how to put in checks, how to do briefings. Um, and we applied it in, this, in, the, in the transfer of patients, f these very sick babies from, uh, intensive care, f from surgery to intensive care. By doing that, this was incredibly successful. Um, it's very media friendly. Um, it got all sorts of attention around the world. And as a result, all sorts of people are using this type of approach in their own hospitals. Um, another great innovation is this simple checklist. This is the English one, but it's, it's designed by the, uh, through a study with the WHO, the World Health Organization. Who've, who've, who have uh, found that if we, if we get doctors, and, uh, doctors to use this checklist before they do an operation, we can substantially reduce the mortality. But getting them to do it is a real challenge, and it remains a real challenge. Um, we still get lots of resistance from doctors and nurses. The technology companies 
uh, a pretty, uh, you know, uh, are really not interested in the sorts of things that, that, uh, that I'm saying. Um, few hospitals are actually really prepared to dig deep enough to work out what's going wrong. Something goes wrong, they say we need another check. And all that means is you just have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of checks, none of which work. We've got a lit litigious and not a learning environment. Um, there aren't many people like me doing this sort of thing around the world. It's very difficult to stay employed, <laughs> you can imagine. Um, uh, most of us aren't actually employed by hospitals, I'm employed by research grants, and so every two years I've got to find another uh, uh, set of money to be doing this sort of thing, which is, seems ridiculous when the figures are so, so huge and the solutions are so obvious. I need to be careful, but I think there are probably more, um, more, more people like me, human factors professionals working in Boeing, than there are worldwide in any hospital. Um, but as technology and treatments become more complex, and as our population ages, and as our resources become stretched, we're going to need to think much more about these things. We can't just rely on medical expertise. The, the, the clinicians are blind to this sort of thing because they have put up with it for so long. So this understanding of safe, designing safer systems based on understanding really what people do, uh, the problems that doctors, doctors and nurses face every day, has become, is going to become more important. That's what I'm passionate about, uh, about what I'm doing. I hope that I haven't scared you. Um, I, because medicine is a tricky thing, and doctors and nurses are fantastic people. But um, we're making progress. But it's going to take 20 years, and I would like to be doing this for 20 years. And I've got the time, and I hope that I'll be able, maybe with your help, uh, to find the means to do that. Thank you very much. I've run well over time. <laughs>